All right, mic check one, two. It's your boy Junior to his house. Is that, yep, it's gonna be on the tape, yep. <sighs> Lee, always doing that to me. Oh, there we go. Did that? Okay, I got it, I got it, I got it. Here we go. Boom. Dang. <laughs> Lil Wayne. It's a line. In a song? Yeah, it's a line in a song, and now it's a sermon title. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. Um, huh? <laughs> yeah, this was the uh, new man, new Rafer uh, listening. So, um, yes, I thought, huh? Joshua. Sorry. Yeah, Joshua. Th See, Amy got it. She caught up. Real G's moving silence like lasagna. That's a cold line, man. Just, I just want to say that. Let's just give Lil Wayne his due real quick. This is all about Jesus, but yo, Lil Wayne, that was a cold line. Real G's moving silence like lasagna. Because when you have that, the G in lasagna is silent. Boom. And when you have that moment, <laughs> see? When you have that moment, you like, oh, snap. Lasagna. Real G's. Real G's moving silence like lasagna. So, sometimes, and this is one of those moments, Jesus, why did you make me a pastor? And he's like, for this. So you can quote Lil Wayne as your sermon title. What up, Don? So, um, what I thought was going to be a three-part series um, and ended last week only is growing, is getting bigger. Um, so, um, yeah, the pamphlet that I gave you, hold on to it. We will walk through this later. Um, today, you will probably need to take notes because it's getting real, real in these streets. So I'm ready. Y'all ready? Let's do this. So humble service. This is what we've been talking about for the last three weeks now. Humility, servants, becoming servants, learning to be legitimately humble before God and before each other. What all that looks like. Last week we washed feet. So let's just jump into it. Humble servants, this is what we are trying to become. True, real, authentic, humble servants of Jesus. He did it for us and we should naturally, out of our relationship with him, be doing that as well. So last week, we looked at Jesus um, washing the feet of the disciples. And in, that, in him washing the feet of the disciples, we looked at why it was important Jesus needed to show them what servanthood looked like as the leader. We said the lowest of the lowest servants was the person who was supposed to wash the feet of the, peop of the people at the party. The disciples knew this and the disciples said, I am not going to be the one who tells Peter that I am lower than him. I'm not going to do it. Um, and then Jesus does it and everybody's freaking out. What? Jesus, the lowest servant is supposed to do that. And Jesus is like, exactly. That's what I've been saying this whole time. Flip the script. So Jesus washes their feet. Peter freaks out. He says, no, you can't do it. I'm not letting you wash my feet, Lord. And Jesus said, well, if you do not let me wash your feet, because this moment is bigger, than me washing your feet, you will have no share with me in the ministry that needs to be carried out. And so I said last week, as I'm going to wash your feet, yes, you have the choice to not get your feet washed, but where we are going and what we want to do, I need to do what Jesus told me to do. He said, the servant is not greater than the master, the leader, the teacher is not greater than the student, whatever part you wanna put in there, we are all equal. And because we are all equal, I will be like Jesus and do what he did. And so I washed your feet last week. I do want to say real quick right here, uh, last week in my explanation of Peter saying no, um, I said there were a lot of people last week who were telling me they did not want to get their feet washed. 
And uh, I said there was one person who told me they were off work and they were not going to be here on purpose because they did not want me to wash their feet. And so after talking to them, they said they would be here and then they were not here. And I mentioned that in the sermon. Um, they had a legitimate reason for not being here. And so I want to say in front of everyone that I stand corrected and I apologize to Destiny for mentioning her in the sermon without knowing that she legitimately could not be here. So I apologize. I talked to her on Tuesday, but I told her that I owed her that in front of everyone because without her name, I called her out in front of everyone. So that is only fair. So during the foot washing service, I told each of you who were here, I knelt down and I said, I am here to serve you and your family as Jesus gives me the strength and the grace to do so. And as I do that, as I serve you and your family, as I serve the people of Oasis, I ask that you do the same, that you serve the people of Oasis, that you humble yourself before God, and that you give as I give, you serve as I serve, that you do as I do. Because I am going to do this for Jesus 100% all the time. And so I knelt down and I asked if you would join me in doing that for each other. Everybody said yes. Wouldn't that be weird though? Well, I, no, I can't, sorry. Like, well, I guess I finished washing your feet since we're here. Anyway, so we did this because God is about to take Oasis to the legitimate next level. There are things, prophecies, um, dreams, visions that God has given to Oasis, and that is, it's time for us to start moving on that. And so with that, that is why we wash the feet. For those who were not here last week, we will, and I'm thinking Good Friday, I have not confirmed this with Lee and Sarah or Breck and Christy yet, but Good Friday, I'm thinking we do a foot washing service. Call or sing a couple songs, and for those who missed it the first time, please show up and be there. I'll wash your feet, and we will go forward from there. Um, yeah. So again, There we go. It's bigger than us. It's bigger than Oasis. It is bigger than what we feel. We are trying to take the city of Clovis back for Jesus. Every person in this city, we want people to show up in Clovis and instead of going, man, it smells like cow poop, that they're like, man, I feel something different in this city and I don't know what it is. That is the goal here. The goal is not for the dreams and the visions to come to pass. It's not to have the park. It's not to give jobs. It's not to pay for teachers out of pocket things. Those will just help us get people to Jesus and getting people to Jesus is the goal here. So the next question is, how do we do this? Oh. Okay, what do we do? What's next? Where do we go from here? And to answer that question, we go to Joshua chapter 5. This isn't catching up. Oh, there we go. Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 through chapter 6, verse 5. It reads, when Joshua was, was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No. Some translations say neither. I'm not for either one. I'm not for you or the adversaries. But I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take off your sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And Joshua did so. Chapter six, verse one. Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war, going around the city once. 
Thus you shall do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horn before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets, and when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, you will hear the sound of the trumpet. Then all of the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. So we all know the story of Jericho. They marched around silently, and the walls fall, and they take the city, all those things. We are going to focus on what happens before the walls fall, because that is where we are right now as Oasis. So, backstory, Israelites and Oasis. One, the Israelites have been in the wilderness for 40 years. 40 years. Most of that, punishment. Their fault. Just listen to Jesus and be obedient and trust him and you will not be in the wilderness for 40 years. I guarantee it. Obedience is what he's looking for. Just be obedient. Love him. Righteousness will come with that and the rest will happen. The Israelites did not do that. So they were in the wilderness for 40 years. Because of this, an entire generation of people, 20 years and up, God says, for everybody who is 20 years and up, you will die in the wilderness. Imagine knowing that you are going to die in the middle of nowhere and there is nothing you can do about it only because you were not obedient and you did not trust God. That's crazy. That's not something to write down. That just came right now. So they crossed the Jordan. The priests carry the Ark of the Covenant into the river Jordan. This river is moving at like 45 miles an hour. It's pretty wide. They step into the river, the water stops, and then the people cross into the promised land. What is the first thing that they do when they get into the promised land? They circumcise every single man. They bring every man back into covenant with God. So all of those who have grown up, as they come to the promise and they are about to take the promise, God says, you have to come in covenant with me because you cannot take this land without me. So come into covenant with me and then the next thing they do is they celebrate Passover, which when you look into the details of the Passover, the Passover has always been about Jesus, it will always be about Jesus. We take important parts that we don't have time for now and we call it communion today. Specifically, the piece of bread that Jesus breaks, I'm going to just say it. The piece of bread that Jesus breaks and says, this is my body, that is part of the bread that is hidden somewhere in the house and somebody has to find it and they get a prize. And it's a whole thing like Jesus is your prize. They weren't saying Jesus is your prize, but for us, Jesus is the prize. That's the piece of bread that Jesus breaks. The one that will be buried and the one that will come back and there is a gift for finding this piece that was buried. Jesus was buried. When you find Jesus, guess what? There is a gift, it's called eternal life. Also, the cup that Jesus says, this is my blood. There are four cups that they take during Passover. The one that Jesus takes is the cup of redemption. I will redeem you. So there are two cups that Jesus does not say, this is my blood. There's one cup that Jesus does not say, this is my blood. This one, the cup of redemption. I will redeem you. He says, this is my blood poured out for you. My blood shed for you to redeem you. That's crazy. Passover has always been about Jesus. So Israelites come back in the covenant with Jesus and then they rekindle their relationship with him through communion or Passover. Two huge things. So when we look at Oasis, we started this church. We already have promises laid out. But before we can get to these promises, what have we been doing for the last two years? Circumcising our hearts. What have we been doing for the last two years? We've been building a culture of just get to Jesus. Rekindle your relationship with him. Just start talking to him. And so much so, I say it so many times, I said it day one, and I will say it until I no longer pastor this church. If you are going to be at Oasis, this is what we're about first and foremost. Cut the dead things from your heart and rekindle your relationship with Jesus. We are not doing church different for the sake of doing it different. We do it different for the sake of you getting to Jesus. 
That's why we're here and that's what we've been doing for the last two years. So when people walk in here, they go, man, something's different about this church. And it's not the fact that I use Lil Wayne lines as sermon titles, that's not it. If that was the case, we'd have a really big church because everybody would be like, what's the title this week? And that's not what's pulling people in. Jesus is pulling people in. And so that's the culture we've been building. And I know for a fact that it has been working because we have not been doing a lot of things that a lot of churches do. We've tried to do a lot of things that other churches do and it doesn't quite pan out like we think it should. But what has been happening is people's lives are changing. People are finding Jesus like they've never found him before. And every day of my life, I would rather have that than anything else because that's why we're here. So that is what we've been doing for the last two years, building this culture of showing people how to get to Jesus. That's why the books are free. That's why the Bibles are free. That's why the journals are free. That's why right now media is free because there is no excuse for you not to get to Jesus. As a church, as long as I am pastor, we are going to give everything that you need to make sure that your heart is continually being circumcised, that the, you are continually letting go of the things that you don't need and that you are always in good relationship with Jesus. That's what we've been doing for the last two years. I didn't look at any of my notes. So, what's next? Joshua, now I'm pacing, it's, going, it's on now. So, it's on now, like I can't even stay still. So, what happens next? Joshua is standing there looking at Jericho. He's looking at Jericho and he's going, man, as anybody would, we're gonna take the city, I don't know how yet, I know we sent the spies in, we do have some angles of attack, we'll see what happens. But he looks up and he sees this man standing there holding a sword. <clears throat> Verse 14, and he asks the man, whose side are you on? And he responds, neither. I am the commander of the Lord's army. This is when things get crazy. You look up that word army and it means servants. Can somebody please tell me what we've been talking about for the last three weeks? Servanthood, humbling ourselves. So this man is standing there with a sword and he says, yo, I am the commander of the Lord's servants. This is legitimately where we get the connection of I serve in the military. I serve. I give myself up for something bigger than me. He said, I'm the commander of those the angelic forces who are going to go fight for Jericho, because we're going to see what the instructions are. I'm in command of them. And even they know that they are, okay, you get it. You get it. This is not a coincidence that this comes up this week. So what does Joshua say to him? Oh, you're the commander? Then what's up? Falls to his face. What does my Lord the one who has power, authority, and influence over my life, what does my Lord have to say to his servant? Oh, dang it. That's like Thor, like, uh, time that wrong. Servant. <laughs> servant. Please, click it, thank you. <laughs> Just click it. What does my, back one. What does my Lord have to say to his servant? And the word servant that he uses, because the definition's up there. It will be. A humble way of referring to one's self when speaking with another of equal or superior rank. A humble way. Coincidence that this word has this definition? No. Jesus is making a bigger point than anything. Servanthood and humility. That's what all of this sits in. All of it sits in servanthood and humility. The commander of the Lord's servants. 
And Joshua then says, how or what does my Lord have to say to his servant? Crazy thing about this is because of Jesus, all of us are equal. So when I look at Aaron, I am her servant. When I look at Vic, I am his servant. But Rafer, you're the pastor, okay? The only difference between a pastor up here and city, or the people here, spiritually, is the responsibility, the responsibility that I carry to Jesus. It has nothing to do with more blessings on this side or that I just know more on this side, no. I am a servant just like everybody else. I just happen to be the oldest kid of the servants, so you don't let your siblings burn the house down when I'm gone. <laughs> That's what it is. It's not, hey, thanks for watching the kids, here's $20. No, it's you are just supposed to watch your siblings because you're the oldest, don't let them mess my house up. So when your sibling drops the two gallon ketchup bottle on the floor, white tile, white walls. I don't know what my mom was thinking, but I knew for a fact this should not have a red tint when she gets home, even though I didn't drop it. And she wasn't gonna get home and go, man, it smells like ketchup. Was it a little kid? Cause I'm gonna whoop them. No. Rafer, why didn't you clean this up well enough? Servant. <clears throat> The only difference is the responsibility that I carry when it comes to God. That's it. But between each other, equal or superior rank, servant. Jesus made all of us equal. That's it. Servant. So, we should be calling each other servants. I'm not even using my notes, but I told Jenny this probably was going to happen. So then, verse 15, we get the answer to what Joshua was looking for. What do you say to your servant? And he says, remove your sandals, because where you stand is holy ground. <coughs> where you stand is holy ground. What do we get from this? What do we get from Joshua taking off his sandals because this is holy ground? Humble service to Jesus is what will give us what God has for us. When we bow down and we kneel and we say, Lord, what do you have for me? God's presence is going to show up. He's going to show up. What we need here and what we should be hoping for is for Oasis to become holy ground. And no, that doesn't mean that the kids stop running around, that my son stops trying to play tag with me in the middle of a song. No, 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 because he knows this is holy ground, so he's doing what God intended for him to do. That's pure worship. Daniela just said it. They don't have any idea what's going on, but they are doing what is innate in them. And you want me to compare it to something? Bears. <laughs> Bears speak no English. They don't write any worship songs. They don't read any scripture. But so will I said, if it all reveals your nature. And Daniela just pointed out, kids are just revealing the nature of our dad. They know this is holy ground. We have to know that this is holy ground. And we have to pray and seek God until it becomes holy ground. Can you imagine that this place becomes so holy that Tracy can't even host parties where they drink in and party in because I just don't feel right here. Yeah. It's Friday night. Party it up, dog. No, it's, they won't do it. And I'll be the first to tell you, please enjoy a beverage, a beverage responsibly. Have a good time. But can you imagine that this room is so holy that when we're not here, God's presence just says it's too much for you. The only people who come in here are those who are seeking me. 
Oasis needs to become holy ground. And crazier than that is when two or three of us are just meeting because we all go to the same church because we know it's bigger. Holy ground now becomes the park. Holy ground now becomes Blackwater. Holy ground now becomes our homes. Crazy part about this is I'm sitting there at Blackwater on Friday, Bible out, laptop, Lil Wayne playing. Cause <laughs> And my homeboy comes up, another pastor. I'm talking to Micah. And Seth Ellsworth comes over. He goes, man, I kid you not, it was five minutes after I wrote this. He walked over. He goes, you know what we should start calling this place? Holy ground, because everybody's got their Bibles out. And I said, shut up. I said, shut up. That's stupid. I said, look, look what I just wrote. And I read it to him. I said, our focus should be for every place we meet to be holy ground, that God the Father will allow us to feel his manifest presence when we meet. Here at church, in the park, small groups, three people hanging out at Blackwater. Everywhere we go, it becomes holy ground. And then he's going to walk over and say what I just typed? I was like, Jesus, I can listen to explicit lyrics while I write sermons because I still hear from you. This is crazy. <coughs> Holy ground. And why do we need this place to become holy ground? Next slide, Jet. Because holy ground produces insight, guidance, instruction. Oh, this is my note right here. Holy ground produces something that does not come from our own power. Holy ground produces something in us that we cannot create or manufacture. Holy ground gives us the tools and the power to move and operate in the things that God wants us to operate in. Holy ground changes lives and changes what happens next and what could be. I say it all the time, my life isn't changing. It's the same, it's the same, it's the same. I don't know what to do. Start seeking God. Because when he shows up, things have to change. They have to. They have to. They literally have no choice. Amy Carter told the story when we were going through Galatians. In Africa, pregnant, malaria mosquitoes everywhere panicking and all I had was the name of Jesus 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 what's up <laughs> Trey Trey what oh Trey Trey needs to go boo-boo oh, all right holy ground man <laughs> The fact that they walked in like, oh, y'all having church here? <laughs> yeah. I just got a visual um, just while you're talking. Yeah. Um, I think we use a lot of God's presence to exist. Like, we use the light as a metaphor a lot. Like, we turn on light in dark room. Dark can't exist in existence of light. Mm -hmm. like, just the holy ground as far as like preparing the surface for God to show up. Right. Like, Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's good. The weight of his presence is literally pushing things out. The weight. And again, there's nothing that we can do outside of seek him for that. That's it. There's nothing more that we can do. Seek him for that. So what happens when Oasis becomes holy ground? Chapter 6, verse 2. He says, I have given Jericho into your hand. God already gave them the win. He already gave them the win. I have given Jericho into your hand. Jericho has no say in this. It's already done. It's already taken care of. 
God already had the commander of his servants beat up every demonic influence over the city of Jericho. And this is important to know. God already did it. He already did it. Nothing that the Israelites would do from here on their own power would even matter. It wouldn't matter. So when we get prophecies for Oasis, this is where it gets crazy, guys. Hold on to your horses. So when we get prophecies where people who don't live here show up and they go, man, I just saw the room full. I saw the room full. The whole room. My immediate thought was, Jesus, what do we do with all those kids? But when the prophecy comes, this room will be full and we only setting up 40 chairs. Um, I don't know how, if you know how full works, Lord. When Michelle stands up and goes, hey, I was in worship and I was like, God, all the things you said about Oasis and what it would be, what's happening? And he says, I'm digging under the foundation. I'm pouring new foundation. I'm doing something new so that when it is time to move, you are cemented into me. When the prophecy comes, this place will be filled with water. It's a lot more. It was Michelle's. Talk to her later about it. But she saw this room filled with water. Clovis, physically and spiritually, is a desert. And we all know what happens when you put too much water in a dry land. It floods. Things die. Things get swept up. It's not good. But God said, I'm not doing that. Through this room, water filled up and springs. She saw springs popping up in the city. What is that, Lord? Those are the homes of the people who attend this church. Those are the homes. So just like God said to Joshua, I have already given you the city of Jericho. God already said, I'm pouring into oasis so that I can come back out of the homes and take over the city. I'm going to soak the soil through the people who live in the city. How are we going to get there? Guys, by being springs in the desert. <coughs> so if God already said, yo, this is what the land at Thornton and Yano looks like. He already said it. He already said it. And when I said, yo, there was nothing the Israelites could do, everybody's like, yeah, there's nothing they can do. And I'm saying there's nothing we can do in our own power except just stay tied to Jesus. He's already said what he's going to do. We just have to stay sty- tied to him. Boom. As it is in heaven, let it be done here. Your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. That's crazy. So look at the instruction that God gives. March silently around Jericho. I've said this and I will always say this, that is not a good military strategy. That is not how one fights a war. I don't know if you knew that, but it is not. Walk silently around Jericho. He gives the city to them and lets them know that there's nothing they can do, and then he gives them instruction. He gives instruction. Walk around the city one time, six days a week, or four, six days. On the seventh day, walk around six times, and then on the seventh time you walk around, yell at the top of your lungs. Jesus, I don't know if you understand, sound cannot make walls fall. Here's the thing, though. Remember the commander of the army 
They were like loosening bricks and stuff. I don't know. But they were doing something that the Israelites couldn't do for themselves. So God needed them to see. He needed them to know that they had nothing to do with it. That the wind was in their obedience. The wind was in their obedience. The wind was not in them marching. The wind was not in them blowing the horns. The wind was in the motive of their hearts. We trust you just enough to just do this. That's why he gives a ludicrous, a very ludicrous instruction. Because he needs us to know it is not in the menial tasks, but in our hearts. So when we say that we are going to serve each other, oh, sorry, right here. This is for us what marching looks like. None of this, none of this is going to take back a city. Reading a scripture on a Sunday morning is not going to take back a city. Clicking slides in the back is not going to take back a city. Putting on a name tag to learn the names of my brothers and sisters in Christ is not going to take back a city. It's not. But you know what, Will? The heart of my obedience to do for this body. My heart in service to look at the sign-up sheets and go, oh, this needs to be done. I'm going to do it. Not because it needs to be done, but because I want to serve the people of Oasis. So gone are the days where and we're in church and we are just like, yo, other people are doing it. Cool. Gone are the days where it's not my problem because I don't do this. Gone are the days because I said I would serve Jesus first and the people of Oasis. So when we come in and we don't know each other's names, put on a name tag. Shake somebody's hand. Introduce yourself. Hey, my name is Rafer. Fun fact. I'm growing my hair out so I can have braids during softball season so people can go, who's that guy with the braids? Oh, that's our pastor. What? <laughs> Pleasure to meet you. That's a real thing, by the way. I just told my brother, I want the six braids, you know, that like hang down, and a bandana. Yeah, that's just, that's just me. Thank you. Thank you. But guys, it's in the small things. When Jesus sees that we can consistently serve each other, when we can just from a heart perspective, not that it's, oh, I got to do it again. No, from a heart perspective. Jesus asked me to serve. I'm going to serve. So where they had to walk around so the walls could fall, so they could take the city, we have to silently march so these four walls can fall and we can go and take the city. We have to break out of this. And we can only break out of this by doing what Jesus asks us to do. Serve each other in humility. And this is not one of those ploys where it's like, oh, let me find a different way to get people to sign up. No, because it's bigger than signing up. If it were about signing up, I would have started that at the beginning three weeks ago. No, I started with servanthood. I started with humility. And then we went to washing feet. Because I need you to know that it's bigger. I need you to do this part. This needs to be part of who you are. Because, Go ahead. Because you were a servant in the beginning and you listened to him about the foot washing, then he gave you this. Right. Like you're just saying like. Because last time I said this, I went <laughs> off and Jesus was not happy with me. <laughs> it is funny. It is. But I said that I was here, 9.45, the first people walked in. And I went and got a burrito, because I was mad. 
and so mad, Lee came and asked me if he could pray for me. And I was like, nah, I'm good. I don't need your prayer. <laughs> I was like, I don't need your prayer. I'm good. I'm already talking to Jesus about how mad I am. I don't need you to pray for me. <laughs> but I had a lady who was sitting in that service. And she came and she told me, God said, don't ever do that again. Teach the people how to serve. She said she had had dreams and she was like wondering all these things and finally it came, boom, here it was. And God said the people need to learn how to be servants. And that was what, before heaven come or right after? But before heaven come, yeah. So that was like June, July, somewhere in there. And so since then, this has been stewing. This has been stewing, not just serving, but servants, like being served. How do I do that, Jesus? And it's about servanthood, first to Jesus and then to each other in humility. In humility. So when I start doing these things, and my heart changes, God will give me the strength and the right attitude to do it. So like I told y'all a couple weeks ago, Rafer on this side says, I don't want to wash your feet and I'm okay, it's good. Nobody wants to see your feet and I don't wanna wash them, so there's that. But in Jesus, he gives me a different heart. He lets me see things differently and he lets me see some things later that I did not see were coming. If I could tell you the stories of what happened on Sunday for individual people, one person had hurt from a kid with pastors. Pastor hurt as a kid. They are a grown adult today. Thank you for doing this. I prayed for her and I, she didn't even tell me what was going on. I prayed everything she was already debating with Jesus about overtaking communion. Because in him, things are different. In him, he will do things that you cannot do yourself. In him. And so that's where my strength comes from. That's where my servant's heart comes from. That's where my humility comes from. I'm not gonna sign up because Rafer asked us to sign up and then three months later, we don't have anybody signing up. And I already did mine, I signed up one time. Everybody knows if I'm not preaching for an extended period of time, of one or two of those weeks, I'm upstairs with kids. Because just like everybody else, I got to take a turn too. How dare me sit here and go, hey, you need to click slides. You need to do this or this is how we're going to take the city. But I can't do my part to help take the city because I'm the pastor. I just preach. That's not fair. And that's not good leadership. You know how many people I talk to and I go, oh yeah, I'm not preaching for eight weeks and I'm doing children's twice. What? You're the pastor. Yeah, that's... that's that's my point. That's my point. I'm equal just like everybody else. I want to do for Jesus just like everybody else should want to do for Jesus. I want to do for Oasis just like everybody else should want to do for Oasis in Jesus. Well, I don't know everybody. Well, you need to get to Jesus and help, like let Jesus help you get to know everybody. I cannot remember names. I'm really bad. Josh and Mercedes will tell you that. I remember it now. <laughs> but I go, I'm not good with names. Jesus, it's the wrong job for me to be bad with names. The wrong job. But in him, it's different. In him, it's different. This is where we put our money where our mouth is. And this is where our hearts 
become all that they need to be so we can see the big visions and the dreams happen in reality, in humble service to him and in humble service to each other. So what comes next? Can you click it, Jed, please? What comes next? We serve each other, and we serve each other with everything that we have. We serve each other when we don't feel like it. We serve each other when we do feel like it. We serve each other when we feel God's presence. We serve each other when we don't feel God's presence. We serve each other in obedience to God. That's what comes next. If all you hear from me today is sign up for things, you're missing it. This is not a sermon that is trying to tell you sign up for things. Because I go legitimately, like I said last week, I do not care about the things. Jesus is going to do what he needs to do. I am concerned about your hearts. That's what I'm asking. Make sure your heart is in Jesus and servanthood, humility, righteousness, holiness. All those things will come from just getting to Jesus. Further, next slide. I handed out these pamphlets. I'm not going to say what I want to say because I'm really happy, but those who know me very well, you know how I feel when I get happy. I want to say words that I shouldn't say that were are here. So I'm just super happy. So this pamphlet, seven weeks. This is what's crazy. Servanthood, humility, foot washing. Jesus, I don't know where to go from here. Jesus says, one, look at the calendar. Look at the calendar. It is seven Sundays between now and Easter. Seven. What? How many days did the Israelites walk around? That's crazy. Seven. Seven days. So, Jesus gives us seven weeks to walk around. Not physically, just like aimlessly walking. We are all not kids. We do have to focus a little bit. But he gives us seven weeks. And over these next seven weeks, you can read the green part later on that inside, first inside flap. Over the next seven weeks, left side, we are going to physically circle the city. I put a map on there and the directions. We are asking that every week, once a week, that you drive around the city. We're gonna to get to the topics of prayer per week, but we ask that every week, once a week, you drive around the city and pray for whatever the topic of the week is. I did a lot of talking to Jesus about the uh, circling and um, he was like, Rafer, calm down, just do a simple square, I get it. You know, like, it's about your obedience. I don't need like a perfect like, but Jesus, we have to go all the way out to Humphrey? You know, like, he's like, no, just, just make it simple so people can drive. It's about the motive, Rafer. I was like, yes, sir, got it, yes, sir. I probably sent 18 Google map things to my email. <laughs> Week seven. We are going to wait until Saturday, the day before Easter, and we're going to drive as a church. We're gonna meet here 10 o'clock and we're gonna drive around the city seven times. And we're gonna pray, I'm gonna make a playlist, um, have Lee make that same playlist on Apple Music, in case you are on Apple Music and not on Spotify, and we're gonna all listen to the same music, we're all gonna pray, we're gonna laugh, we're gonna dream, we're gonna drive seven times the day before Easter, the day after we have another foot washing service. Inside cover or inside part, fasting. The three types of ways to fast are right there and we're going to fast on Thursdays. Pick the type of fast that you want to do and your motive of prayer, we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna have seven different things we're gonna pray for over the next seven weeks. Excuse me, but we will pray or fast on Thursdays. So if you want to drive on Thursday because you're already fasting, cool. If it works out better for you, whatever day of the week, do it. Just do it. Nike, baby. Fasting. Three types are there. Posture of my heart. And I'm going to pray three times a day. The prayer side. 
We have to keep Jesus in the front of all of this. One, the commander of the Lord's army was there already. And two, the priests had to carry the Ark of the Covenant in front of everybody. God went before them. So if we're going to do this, we have to keep God before us. And we have to keep ourselves before God through this process. So over the next seven weeks, our topics will be obedience and a change of heart towards humble service. Next Sunday, we'll start for Oasis. We'll be praying for Oasis to become a holy ground, to become holy ground. The week after that, dreams, visions, guidance, and insight, because we've already prayed for God to rest here. Now we can start praying for the dreams and the visions and the guidance and the insight. The week after that, we're going to pray about the tools and the people that God gives us those things, that the people come to us to make these things happen. The week after that will be the land at Yano and Thornton. So every time you drive past it, every time you drive past it, you get to pray over the land at Thornton and Yano. That's crazy. The week after that, we're going to pray for revival in Clovis, that Jesus will show up and that he will change this city, not because of us, but with our help. And not that he needs our help, but we get the honor of helping him take back his city that he already bought anyway. They said that I haven't come. You giving your life to Jesus is just giving him what he paid for. Dang. So you telling me I'm a can of beans and I'm like, I'm not going with you, sir. You know what I'm saying? Could you imagine if your beans said that? <laughs> like, God, bruh, I'm making chili. Yes, you are. I pay for you. I'm glad Jesus don't have that attitude with me. And then the last week, God's eyes and his heart for Clovis. This is what we're going to pray for over the next seven weeks. Thursdays, we're going to fast. And once a week, I ask that you drive around the city. And it's just simple. Norris, right here, North 684 to MLK, MLK up to Yano, Yano back to Norris. All right turns, so you don't have to sit at lights, you know. But that's what we're doing. Circling the city, marching silently in here, in service to each other consistently, in humility to Jesus. And then physically circling the city. So, we're going to go into the holy place. And I'm going to play this song, God of Revival. Listen to it. Look over your pamphlet. But this song is, a, is going to be our anthem over the next seven weeks at least. I'm not saying we're going to sing it every week. That's Nani and Jesus' decision. Um, but if I had my way, we'd probably be singing it every week. But you know what? Anyway, that's between her and Jesus. God of revival, listen to it. Listen to the words. Make this your prayer. Make it your prayer for yourself. Make it your prayer for our church, for a Clovis, and whoever else you think needs revival. Like I said, this is our anthem over the next seven weeks, and this is our prayer. After Holy Place, I will dismiss, so if you need to go, you can go, um, but I will answer any questions that you have about the pamphlet um, so we all are on the same page. So let's go into the Holy Place, and um, afterwards, we will um, answer questions. <laughs>